Thank you. Pick it for me and do it again. Can we get a new battery? Yes, yes, I love that. We shall overcome. We pray for love to lead the way. Happy Easter to everyone. Click again. So, have you heard the one about the, the teacher who asked the kids? Today's Resurrection Day, right? So the teacher, I think, said, I think she was third grade, fourth grade, maybe. She asked her students, how many of you know, does anyone know what, res what resurrection is about? And when, <laughs> Norm is laughing already. Because one of the kids raised his hand and said, I don't know what resurrection is, but if it lasts for longer than four hours, you probably should go to the hospital. <laughs> but I'll fuck. <laughs> Happy Easter. So we know we know what the season is about, right? It's about renewal and rebirth and resurrection and new life, new life. Ooh, yes, breathe all of that in. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? New life is a wonderful thing. We like to laugh here, too. We love to eat. We love to have a good time here. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you know, but have you ever looked at Easter and wondered, what is all of this about? Why do we have Easter bunnies, and we have eggs, and we have Jesus on the cross, and we have all these, this mixed mash of things? Anybody else ever wonder that stuff besides me? No, I did. No? You did? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, I did. I always wondered, what was that? What is that about? Well, some of you may, I know a lot of you know, a lot of people here. If you've been on the spiritual path for a while and, and have kind of studied other things, you might know some of the history behind this. So the word Easter, Easter actually comes from, uh, well, how do I coach this? There are lots of traditions that are part of Easter. Let's put it that way. And a lot of the traditions have to do with pagan ritual. How many of you knew that? Cool. Oh, great, great. I love it. I love an informed group of people. So Easter was a celebration of named after the goddess of spring, I think is her name. She goes by different names. Ostara, Astara, Easter. I don't know. There's lots of different names for her. And uh, so all of the, the ceremonies, ancient ceremonies, were again around renewal and rebirth. It's celebrated very often in the spring at the time of the equinox when darkness you know, starts to, to fade. We don't have as much darkness in our world and we're moving back toward light. So people were always excited about that. And there was cause for celebration to say, look, our days are gonna be longer. It's gonna be time for harvest and all these wonderful things. Now, let's see, what else? Uh, Ostara, let me tell you a little bit more about her. She was called the bringer of light after the long dark winter. She was a goddess who was often depicted with a hare or a, or a rabbit. That was her thing, that was kind of like her. So, so that's part of the, the Easter tradition where the Easter bunny comes from, is that the, the rabbit was the symbol of fertility and the arrival of spring. Then there were all these other resurrection um, myths. How many of you are familiar with those? I don't know if you've heard of any of those. But apparently, Jesus the Christ was not the first one to have had a similar story. There were multiple other ones. There was one called Ishtar, also Inanna, who was from back 2100 BC. So we're talking over 5,000 years, over 4,000 years ago. Uh, in the, the mythology, Ishtar is grief stricken. Her, her, her husband dies and she goes into the underworld following him. And while she is there, they remove all of her earthly attire, her body, everything. And then she is, is left naked and bowed low. She is judged, she's killed, and she's hung on display. Now in her absence, while she's in the one underworld, uh, is when winter comes. So the gods didn't like that. They decided they needed to bring her back so that we could have spring again. So that was one of them. Then there's another one called uh, Horus. Horus was an Egyptian god. How many of you are familiar with that one? <laughs> Lots of interesting parallels between Horus and Jesus. So let's see, both of them were conceived through a virgin. They were both born in a cave. An angel heralded their birth to their respective mothers. Let's see. Uh, ancient Egyptians observed the birth of Horus um, in December, December 21st. Uh, let's see. Both births were witnessed by shepherds, etc., etc. Both of them were crucified next to thieves. Both were buried in the tomb. A lot of similarities with Horus. 
Then we have Dionysus, who was the divine child, and that was a Greek one, who was resurrected by his grandmother and then brought his own mother back to life. And then there's another one. Now, I'd never heard of this one before. It was a cult that, flo they called it a cult, that flourished during the time of Jesus. When Christianity was coming up, there were like conflicting religions happening at the same time, beliefs. And this one, this cult was called Cybel, was the name of the goddess, I believe. Her lover, Addis, was also born of a virgin. He died and he was born, reborn annually. So this spring festival began as a day of blood on what they called Black Friday, rising to a crescendo after three days, and then everyone would rejoice over his resurrection. Sound familiar? So interesting. Isn't it interesting? So the article goes on to say that there was violent conflict on Vatican Hill during the early days of Christianity, particularly over this other, uh, the Addis religion. Uh, and it's said here that what is interesting to note here is that in the ancient world, wherever you had a popular resurrection <coughs> god myth, Christianity find, found lots of converts because it was already familiar to them. So that's kind of that piece of the history, why we've got eggs and rabbits and all of these other things going, mixing along with the story of Jesus and the resurrection. But most of us in here, most of us are familiar, I would say, how many of you were raised in a traditional Judeo-Christian? You know, Jesus, is, the Easter Sunday is about the resurrection, when we celebrate the resurrection of the Christ. So that's where I'm going to focus my attention. So in Centers for Spiritual Living, we, we are not not Christian, but we're not specifically Christian. I'll put it that way. You know, and, and I personally, I, I love Jesus, like original Jesus freak. You know, I loved the teaching. I was raised uh, Catholic, and I can remember. Anybody else get a copy of The Good News? Does anybody remember that? The good news, if you were raised Catholic, you might have gotten that. I, I was probably, I don't know, first grade when I got my very own copy of the Gospels, the good news. And it's still not working. It's still not going. Yeah, the good news, AKA the Gospel, the Gospel. It is the, the four uh, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the good news. And so what I wanted to do was just kind of boil down, what was the teaching of Jesus? Why was this so significant? Why was this, here we are talking about it and arguing about it and all this crazy stuff thousands of years later. Something significant must have happened. Something significant. But most significant was, was the man himself and what he taught. So here was just, I'm going to just boil it down to the essence of what Jesus came here and taught. Right. We see in Paul, this is, this is from the New Testament, from the good news, that in God, we live, move, and have our being. In God, we live, move, and have. In other words, it is everywhere. We can't, we are immersed in it. We can't not be a part of it, right? We are always in this God stuff. It runs in, around, and through all we are. The next one. I'm going to need help with this because it's not going well. Okay, great. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Those are the words of the Christ himself. Right? So God, again, he came into a very different kind of a world. And he was teaching people that God is not out there someplace. The spirit is right here within you, right? It runs in, around, and through all things, including where you are. And then the last thing, God is love. God is love. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. To me, that's a pretty clear, pretty simple message, right? God is everywhere. We are part of it. And God is love. Now, you all know the, the great commandments. Does anybody remember those? As Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, what, what, what are the great commandments? What's the law? Go ahead, Rick. Okay, the first one is love your, love your, love your God. Um, for all others, and the other one is um, love your neighbor as yourself. Exactly, exactly. And here it is, underlined. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first commandment. The second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So there's that word again, right? Love God. Love your neighbor. You know? know that it's all within you. The great commandment. 
Isn't that something? I mean, it's just really that simple. And then, then we have this, this story of the crucifixion. And again, as I said, I was raised Catholic. Um, and I was very much, I did all the stuff, you know? I did all of the, I did the summer camps. I sang with the youth group. I did all of those things, and I was all in it. And, and I can remember doing the Stations of the Cross. Anyone else do that? Anyone else do Catholic remember that? You know, where you go into the church and the stained glass has all the different points in, in Christ's journey as he was carrying the cross. And we would stop at the different ones and we would talk about it. And I can remember just the tears, just the sobbing, like, oh my goodness, he was, what an amazing, amazing being this was who had a message of love and peace and hope and for that, for that, he was crucified. You know, and then there's the story of, of all the, the guilt, you know? I mean, it starts when you're little too, right? Right? Like we needed Jesus to be our Lord and Savior because of the horrible sinners that we were. And I just remember feeling so awful about that. You know, then, then there, there was a, a point when I started, I guess maybe around middle school or high school, something like that, you start questioning, looking and wondering different things. And, and I can remember a time when I was a kid, my, my parents had foster kids in the house. And, and um, in our culture, the belief was spare the rod, spoil the child. There were going to be no spoiled children in my parents' house. Let me just tell you that. Or my grandparents, or my aunts and uncles, or anybody else, right? So if you did something wrong, there were going to be some physical consequences, and it wasn't fun. So I was probably maybe eight or nine years old, and I broke something, and, and I didn't want to face the music. So I said I didn't do it. I lied about it. And one of the other kids in the house got blamed for it. And, uh, and, it, and it was physical, and it wasn't fun. And I felt so horrible about that, that she basically, she took the rap for me. I didn't get the beating, but she did. And, and it was horrible, it was horrible. I thought, I will never, ever do that to another human being again. You know, I, I, I will take accountability. I'm an oldest child, very responsible. Don't, don't take what's mine to take, right? So that's kind of, you know, how I grew up. And then we have this idea of this, this Christ, this one who, who came again for nothing but good, for with a message of love and forgiveness, and now he's been strung up on this cross because of me? I just couldn't be with that. You know, really, it, 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 it felt like repulsive. You know, it's like, if you all wanna believe that, that's fine, but if I did something, then I will pay the consequences for that. I don't need somebody else to do it for me. Does anyone else get that? So, so you know, then I find new thought and I find out all of the backstory of Easter and all of these other things, and I just really had a hard time with all of these different Christian holidays and, and this idea that, um, that this man suffered uh, because of me, because I don't even know what. Why? Because I was bored? It just didn't make any sense. So I went completely another direction. And then here I am as a minister. And this is my third year now, but you know, in practice for some years before that. And always these holidays give me the worst time. I would have the most horrible time with Easter and Christmas of just trying to reconcile what is the meaning of all of this stuff and not buying into the, the parts of the story that just didn't feel like they served me. Can anyone else relate here? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was where, like, I couldn't even be here on an Easter Sunday because it just aggravated me so much. And driving down the road and seeing all of this stuff. I just, I don't like being scammed. <laughs> I don't like feeling like I was scammed. And I felt like so much of the story was a scam. It really bothered me. So I've spent now these years just going through it, like what is the message for me? I don't wanna feel like this about any holiday. I know that then I'm not in my right place if I'm feeling this angst about all of this. And so my understanding has grown. It has grown over the years. And I'm back to loving Jesus again, loving the message. And I think I found something new this year even for myself. So we talked about Jesus and his teaching while he was living. There was a lot that came out also through his crucifixion and his death. If y'all remember, what was like the first thing, one of the first things he said? 
when he was on the cross. He went through all of the agony, all the torture, all the things that they did. They nailed him to the cross. And then what was the first thing he said? Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Totally in line with everything else that he had taught. It was all about forgiveness. Here he was, had been tortured, had been betrayed, had had all of these awful things happen to him. And the first thing he said was forgive them for they know not what they do. Totally a line. A big elaborate lesson. A big elaborate lesson. Yes, a lesson. And then there were some other things that he said, behold your son to his mother. He said that he was thirsty. And then he said, reportedly said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How many of you remember that mm -hmm. part of the message? So as I was doing some research uh, for, this, for this lesson, I wanted to know exactly what did he say, what were those words, because that kind of, there's a dissonance for me in that again. And I found that there is another actual interpretation. You know, Jesus spoke a language called Aramaic. Right, which was then translated into the Greek, which was then translated into all of these other languages. And if you go back to the Aramaic, what he said, and we have an Aramaic dictionary, we have, a, I'm sorry, a, a Bible written by Lamsa, George Lamsa, which is the Aramaic translation. In other words, the language that, he would, that Jesus would have spoken when he was alive. And their translation of the words that he said at that point was not, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But my God, my God, for this I was kept. This is my destiny. In other words, he knew. He knew what was happening. Right? He knew it. He stepped into it willingly. He accepted it. He accepted it knowing that this is what was his to do. A very different message, isn't it, than the feeling of, of God leaving him. But know that this is what he was here to do. And I have to imagine that if he was as connected, as he lived in that knowing of who he truly was, that he was God's stuff, right, then there wouldn't have been all of that angst. There wouldn't have been that suffering, right? He went into it knowing what he was doing. And so I don't think, I personally, you, you all are welcome to, to take this however you want to take it, right? We all, I believe that we all need to interpret the scripture and we interpret what we are told in our own ways, right? In a way that works for us. And I encourage you to question everything. Just because I say something here from the pulpit doesn't mean you have to believe it. So I think in my interpretation of this is not that Jesus died to absolve us of our sin, right? To say because he died, then we don't have to worry about what we do anymore, what we say, as long as we believe, as long as we confess and we're okay. I don't buy that. I personally, I don't, I don't buy into that at all. What I believe is that Jesus suffered some of the, the most incredible suffering that anyone would ever suffer, right? Betrayal, physical torture, misunderstanding, like all of this stuff completely and wholly undeserved. And he could still say, forgive them, forgive them. What kinds of things, what crosses do you bear? Right? What crosses, what things are you carrying? What, what doubts, what fears, what uncertainties, what anger, what pain, what things are you carrying? Have you been carrying for years that are your crosses that you bear? Right, of somehow not being good enough not smart enough, not pretty enough, not rich enough, or maybe too much of something else. And we carry these crosses throughout our lives. Right? Jesus carried it and he, and he released it. And he released it. And we can do the same. We don't have to. We don't have, we can. You certainly can. If you want to keep carrying those crosses, if you want to keep carrying the burdens, you're welcome to do that. Right? We all have free choice. We can do that. But why would we? Right? Esther, it's, it's kind of silly. Why would we do that? Why would we do that? Then after saying that, after saying, right, for this I was born, the next thing he says is, into your hands I commend my spirit. Right? Releasing everything. Just falling in 
to the arms of spirit. And what happened? It was finished. It was done. The physical form was done. The physical form was done. Right? But the Christ, the essence, the part of him that was true, that was real, that is within each and every one of us, went on. It goes on. Right? Here is what we believe in Centers for Spiritual Belief. Centers for Spiritual Living. We believe in the eternality, the immortality, and the continuity of the individual soul forever and ever expanding. In other words, we are all immortal already. Already, here and now. There is a part of you that has always been. There is a part of you that will always go on. Whether your physical body is here or not, there is that essence of you that is the truth of who you are. And we don't have to bargain for it. We don't have to say the right things, behave the right way. It, it doesn't work that way. We're immortal whether we choose to be or think we are or believe it or not. Right? We don't have to play with God. We don't have to placate this angry God to make it so. We are already immortal beings. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to be to make it so. Now, is that a freeing thing for anybody else? Yes. And I love the imagery of the, of the butterfly. Because when the, when the caterpillar goes into its cocoon, y'all know what happens to it? Its body actually liquefies. It kind of dissolves. So for the caterpillar, it's the end. Right? For the caterpillar, it's the end. But there are some cells that are part of its makeup. They're actually called imaginal cells. Isn't that interesting? Imaginal cells. And those are the cells that rearrange themselves to, so that the butterfly emerges from it. Right? A completely different life. Completely, utterly transformed. So what if our fear of death, what if that's the last week's scam? Right? right? That we've been raised in, in culture and society that is, is terrified of physical death. And what if that's the next big scam? Mm. Right? That the life after the, the, the oneness, the wholeness. I, I love my friend, my, my soul sister over there, Nira. She shared an analogy with me the other day that, that I also had held, and she said it so beautifully, that our life, you know, that you've heard the Rumi quote, that, that we are like the ocean, you know, the drop of water that each one of us, that God, let's say, is like the ocean. And each one of us is like a drop of water in that ocean, or a wave, if you want to call it that. And then the wave comes, and it's on the water, and it crests, and, it, and then it flows back into the water. And then it becomes part of another, and it crests, and it flows back into the water. But it is always part of the water. It's all connected, each and every part of it. Right? You can't separate. If you take that one drop of water out of the ocean, it is still ocean stuff. It's not the whole ocean, but it is part of that same stuff. We are that same. We are God's stuff. Right? Like a wave cresting in the water. And when our time is done, we go back to the wholeness. And then we come back and we crest again as another wave. Always there forever and ever expanding. Ernest Holmes said, the universe does not demand suffering. Suffering is man-made through our own ignorance, our ignorance of the truth of who we are. Right? We live our lives, like I think so many of us live these, these small little lives where I'm going to just play it safe, uh, so I don't know what, so I could live a little bit longer? You know, I don't know. <laughs> because... The bottom line is that we're all checking out. You all know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> our time, each and every one of us, our time in the physical body is limited, is limited. So make the most of your time. That's the message, right? Make the most of your time while you're here. Because lights out at some point for all of us, right? So you might as well enjoy it. The suffering, you know, Jesus died on that cross. He suffered all of those horrible things that I, I, I guarantee, I mean, I know some of you, maybe we've all had our bumps and bruises, right? We've all had our thing. But what could happen to you that could be unforgivable? 
Is there anything? Is there anything? And you know, the longer you hold on to that unforgiveness, the longer you stay in the tomb, the longer you stay in the pain. So Ernest Holmes said, the universe doesn't demand suffering. Suffering is man-made through our own ignorance. Someday we will decide that we've had enough suffering. It doesn't mean that things won't happen to you that hurt, that, that hurt, right? People will die, you will lose your, people lose their jobs. You know, we have health challenges. We have all these things that happen. All of these things happen. But do we have to suffer? Do we have to hang on to it? It's your choice, right? It's your choice. It's all of our choice. We don't have to suffer. You have the power to draw upon the great reservoir of infinite wisdom, capable of solving your every problem through the channel of an all-inclusive faith. However, such faith is in action only when you have completely surrendered all of your doubt, your resentment, all your fears, whether they be big or little. Remember, faith is natural. Fear is unnatural. You know, Jesus also said we needed to be like little children. Can you say that? Yeah. That the only way we could enter into the kingdom is to be like children. Now, how, are, how do you think children are different than us? They live from a sense of wow. They live from the now. They live with that sense of awe. What else? Everything is fresh. They don't have Everything is access. fresh. Everything is brand new. They're not carrying stuff with them. What else? They're not overthinking. They're not overthinking things. They're not overthinking things. I have two beautiful little grandsons. They're two years old. Both of them have this weird thing of like this trust fall thing that they do. Like oh, they're just standing there and all of a sudden, whoo! I'm just going to drop back <laughs> and know somebody's going to catch them. <laughs> and nine times out of ten, there is somebody there to catch them. <laughs> but kids just have this knowing that they're always going to, that they're going to be taken care of, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that mom is there, dad's there, somebody's there. I'm okay. You know, they, they don't worry. They don't worry. It's like the lilies in the field, right? You know that scripture, how beautiful they are. And do they do anything for that? They just do the birds in the field. They, their food is there. How much? How much more important? How much are we? You know, to think that we don't have everything we need. If God takes care of the birds, He's going to take care of you too. He's going to take care of you too. Right? Just have that that knowing, that faith, the faith of a child, of knowing that everything is going to be okay. Right, Donna? Everything is okay in the end. You know about it? If it's not okay, it's not the end. It's not the end. <laughs> And so that brings us to our to the affirmation, the idea of rising. And how do we rise? How do we rise? You know, you want to travel light. You want to be light. You can't rise if you're if you're burdened with a lot of stuff from the past, right? You can't rise if you keep hanging on to to the betrayals and to the to the anger and to the hurts and to all of those things that have you crucified right now. You rise by releasing resentment. You rise by releasing fear and doubt and then surrendering into that love that is the truth of who you are. Right? I leave you with that.